If you want to watch the full uncut version of this video featuring detailed discussions of Edward's analog obsession, toxicity, and some underrated romantic elements of the novel, you can subscribe to my Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Shanspeare. There will also be a link down below because I'm good at my job. Not much has changed in North American pop culture in the past 14 odd years. I mean, not much has changed in the United States since the late 1700s because we're all imprisoned by the decisions and principles of a select group of people who would have a conniption if they saw what we were capable of in this godforsaken year. But I digress. <clears throat> Is 2008 all over again? My Chemical Romance is releasing music, sequins are unfortunately making a comeback, and most importantly, Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart are making waves in the film industry, with Kristen Stewart's highly awarded performance of Princess Diana in Spencer, and Robert Pattinson's highly acclaimed role as Batman in Matt Reeves' The Batman. Two years ago, Twilight itself saw a revival with the introduction of an entire renaissance and the publishing of Midnight Sun. A companion novel that follows Edward Cullen's melodramatic ass instead of Bella Swan. I didn't get a chance to read it until this year, and funnily enough, it wasn't until I saw The Batman four times, mind you, that I decided to bite the bullet and re-enter my Twilight phase. For today's viewers, I've decided to make it everyone's problem. While reading, I couldn't help but notice how similar Edward is to Matt Reeves' vision of Batman. This Byronic, Nirvana listening, pathetic, drenched boy falling in love with someone who is quite possibly out of his league, predicating his life on vengeance, and probably smudging some black eyeliner on in between insult meetings. Sorry intel meetings. The most interesting similarity is how good at everything Bruce and Edward are, to the point of it being annoying. They're both considered very attractive, very rich, and very talented. Perhaps the second one begets the third in a weird, capitalistic way, but whatever. They're also both polyglots, meaning they both speak multiple languages, Spanish being a defining one in both Midnight Sun and The Batman. And since I use Babbel, that means... I'm sort of like Batman, but middle class and not a cop. This video is sponsored by Babbel. As you know, I started using Babbel late last year to get ahead of my 2022 goals, one of which was to finally learn Spanish. I've always been of the belief that I should have been taught another language really early in my life because there's no way this 23 year old brain is picking up anything new. But I'm pleasantly surprised by how much knowledge I'm able to store using Babbel. Something about it is just so easy and so fulfilling Feeling that it genuinely feels like I'm making progress, unlike other apps. Maybe it's the short interactive lessons, maybe it's the fact that the lessons are designed by real language teachers instead of an algorithm, maybe it's Maybelline, I don't know. But I do know that Babbel has really cracked the code here. Every day I do a lesson, I have the option to try something new. I have access to podcasts, games, and even live classes with teachers in my target language. And now that summer's here, I'm trying to live my best caliente girl summer. And you can too because Babbel has an award-winning technology that is scientifically proven to get you speaking your target language in just three weeks. Even if you're staying home or going abroad this summer, you can always spice it up by building your language bank. I mean, what's hotter? than being multilingual. Como se dice nada excepto the Batman highway scene in Espanol. If you're interested, make sure to click the link in my description box to get 65% off and start getting summer ready today with Babbel. Thank you to Babbel for sponsoring this video and making this next sentence possible for me to attempt. Mas se consigue lamiendo que mordiendo. If I said that correctly without somehow referring to my vagina, this statement translates to more is achieved by licking than by biting. Not necessarily a euphemism. This is a saying that would have done us some good in 2007. It may have even delivered Midnight Sun to us far earlier than 2020. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar, after all. This novel has a complicated history for something that came out like two years ago. I know it has a lot of sticky tabs in it. Stop looking at them. Even though it's physically young, this book has existed in some form at least since 2007, as Stephanie Meyer had Catherine Hardwick, the director of the first Twilight movie, and Robert Pattinson, who played Edward Cullen, read a few chapters from her drafts in order to better understand Edward's character. At the time, she had no intention of anyone else reading these files, so naturally, they were leaked. Stephanie Meyer immediately halted the press, fired the staff, 
retreated into her gothic manner in a stylish black feathered robe which looked rather cool, might I say, as the lightning and the thunder flared around her, and she vowed to never touch this book again until everyone forgot it existed. Flies, meet Vinegar. 13 years go by. It's now May 2020. The Twilight Renaissance is at its peak. People are funneling even more money into the Twilight cinematic universe. Twilight TikToks are going viral, fan fiction is being written so fast, people's laptops are smoking, and Tumblr is having its first heyday since 2012. I smell money. I mean, honey. It's during this time that Stephanie Meyer releases Midnight Sun. Based on the immortality of the original series, you would imagine the comeback being celebrated, nay, lauded as the best happenant since its first introduction in 2005. No, people hate it. People are booing. The comeback isn't beloved, it's feared. It's like if you dug up some old, weird, decaying man with killer hair and a fantastic rack with soft wispy eyelashes and called him Sigmund Freud. Something is wrong. We're very, very right. Mary Solosi urges readers to not stare straight into the midnight sun in their review for Entertainment Weekly. Even having lived a century with unlimited time, extensive resources, and the actual ability to read minds, Edward's narration is neither more erudite nor more insightful than Bella's, though the novel tries to convince us that it is, Solosi argues. A sentiment even more scalding in the review states, the degree to which Edward mentally tortures himself for potentially endangering his beloved is nothing compared to the punishment he inflicts on a reader. Reader. He's convinced that he's the worst thing that could ever happen to her, and after spending this much time in his brain, it's impossible not to agree with him. Like Twilight, Midnight Sun is facing its own public execution through frustrated reviews and various social media takedowns. It's reminiscent of the tone I left behind at the end of my prequel video, where I wondered if pop culture is right about Twilight. Diehard vampire fans tend to view it as a maggot-infested, horrible, disgusting, gut-wrenching piece of garbage that deserves to be spat on, nay, withheld from even the most basic forms of liquid, even spit as it rages on in flames. Other people just think Robert Pattinson's kind of hot. <laughs> Personally, I believe Midnight Sun is more complex than either side gives it credit for. While reading, I was almost surprised by the amount of genres Stephanie Meyer was able to fit into one novel. One brick-sized, mule-near-ass novel. And this all stems from the many ways we can read Edward Cullen's character. He's a strange mix of Joe Goldberg from You, Tom Hansen from 500 Days of Summer, and a sprinkle of the poet Lord Byron, minus everything that makes that guy cool, and more so for just how wretched he is. Thus, Midnight Sun is an intricate horror romance that could rival even the greatest. <clears throat> Dim the lights. There's a title card coming. When Stephanie Meyer pitched her first novel, Twilight, to publishers, she called it a, quote, suspense romance horror comedy, end quote, which pretty much sums up the entire thesis of my video and could have saved me hours of reading and annotating to come up with something I thought was strictly original, but hey. Ask any horror fan what they think of Twilight, and it tends to go something like this Rotten Tomatoes review. As someone who has loved the horror genre my whole life, Twilight pains me. Or this one. Horror fans will find a little to sink their teeth into, but it'll get teenage hearts fluttering like orga okay. Twilight as a horror novel doesn't really sit well with audiences or critics. But in my opinion, there are aspects of Midnight Sun that could rival even the king of horror. Steven. <laughs> Some people cite purity culture propaganda as an example of the saga's horror politics, best noted by the wait till marriage subplot between Bella and Edward. One subscriber notes how vampirism in the series can also be viewed as a metaphor for marriage or abstinence. Other subscribers cite the imprinting debacle, the treatment of indigenous characters, renegade, and the vilification of Jacob post New Moon. Of course, the most obvious aspect of horror in the novel refers to what the Cullen clan actually are. Say it. Vampires. Stephanie Meyer did little to no research on vampires before pinning Twilight, and if we were to compare much of the lore presented in the novels and the illustrated guide versus what we know as truth in historic vampire lore, that becomes obvious. She states, The only time I really did any research on vampires was when the character Bella did research on vampires. Because I was creating my own world, I didn't want to find out just how many rules I was breaking. 
end quote. Twilight vampires don't have fangs, which is a long contested aspect of their writing. Instead, their teeth are razor sharp at the edges, unbreakable and strong enough to cut through almost any material, all while appearing identical to human teeth. They have venom-based fluids that take over the role of similar human fluids, which everyone finds out rather belatedly in Breaking Dawn. They don't turn into bats, they don't burn in the sun, and coffins are rather offensive to bring up around them. Whereas historical accounts of vampires usually position them as grotesque undead demons feeding on the lives of their relative, Twilight features young, charming, and unnaturally beautiful vegetarians who, quote, do not develop emotionally or mentally past the age at which they are transformed end quote. Which, yeah, whatever. That ruins about three-fourths of my original Twilight video's argument, but whatever. The competition continues. Stephanie? Most interesting to me about Twilight vampires is the fact that there's something unnerving about them beneath their beauty. Edward says that they are close enough to humans for them to pass, yet they're also far enough away to strike fear. The scene where Charlie Swan, Bella's father, meets Edward for the first time is evidence of this effect. Quote, Charlie opened the door, his eyes focused at about my shoulder height. He had been expecting someone shorter. He readjusted and then staggered half a step back. Like any normal human, suddenly standing just a foot away from a vampire would send adrenaline racing through his veins. Fear would twist in his stomach for just a fraction of a second, and then his rational mind would take over. His brain would force him to ignore all the little discrepancies that marked me as other. His eyes would refocus, and he would see nothing more than a teenage boy." End quote. I switched seats because my back was about to fall off the bone like a baby back rip. Other than this, there is nothing about the vampires in Twilight that seem any more horrific than their distant folkloric relatives. In fact, most of the horror surrounding vampire lore in the novel stems from much more unintentional elements. I really hate to make it about politics. Back in 2018, Catherine Hardwick, the director for the first Twilight movie, alleged that Stephanie Meyer refused her suggestion of adding diversity to the main cast. Quote, she probably just didn't see the world that way. And I was like, oh my god, I want the vampires. I want them all. Alice, I wanted her to be Japanese. I had all these ideas, and she just could not accept the Cullens to be more diverse, because she had really seen them in her mind. She knew who each character was representing in a way, a personal friend or a relative or something." End quote. In fact, Stephanie Meyer allegedly pointed out that in the books, vampires have pale, glistening skin, making it impossible for them to be anything but white. She only allegedly relented when Catherine Hardwick suggested for Laurent, one of the franchise's ambiguous villains, to be black, and Bella's human friend who get less lines than 2012's Louis Tomlinson and Niall Horan to feature Hispanic, Asian, and Black characters. At face value, this seems suspicious. Who else but someone Lana Del racist would ban people of color from her book? We could take it there, but really, if Stephanie Meyer didn't imagine her immediate main characters as anything other than white, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. We often write from what we know, and Stephanie knows whiteness. To a detriment, apparently, because it doesn't just stop at a preference or an unfortunate yet unintentional exclusion. Stephanie's earlier emphasis of pale, glistening skin doesn't just refer to the Cullen clan, who were white in their human life. Referred to as a universal pallor of skin, Meyer explains that once transformed, quote, vampire venom leaches all pigment from the skin as it changes the human skin into the more indestructible vampire form. Regardless of original ethnicity, a vampire's skin will be exceptionally pale. The hue varies slightly, with darker skinned humans having a barely discernible olive tone to their vampire skin, but the light shade remains the same." End quote. What'd you say fuck me for? People like to give her the benefit of the doubt with this, saying the wording implies that dark-skinned people look the same but are slightly paler. And that would make sense. But that's not what she says. The phrase, hue very slightly, refers to the difference between white vampire skin and dark vampire skin. Stephanie is saying that dark-skinned humans have their pigment bleached out of them to the point of them nearly resembling their white counterparts. The only visible difference is an olive tone. Olive skin tones vary in shades and lightness, but what leads readers to believe that this specific olive tone is a fair olive tone is the context clues surrounding it, such as exceptionally pale, light shade, and barely discernible. Now, 
I'm not a doctor or a mortician or a person with more than five working brain cells, so forgive me. But does melanin completely dissipate from your body after you die? I don't think it does, but who am I to say? I do, however, know that melanin production ceases to exist in an undead person and venom bleaching their skin white to make it indestructible are two different arguments. It's also just funny because as we learned in the prequel to this video, vampires have historically been seen as a metaphor for racial otherness. In a tweet by Ryan Ken, yes, I'm citing tweets now, the sentiment is further supported. Quote, it kind of amuses me when white people don't want non-white people in their sci-fi slash fantasy when most of these stories are just allegories about how non-white people are treated. For a certain type of white fan, I think the real fantasy appeal is getting to imagine you're resilient. End quote. So sitting there listening to Edward go on and on about how othered he is, how differently he's treated for what he is and what he looks like, while simultaneously knowing Stephanie's stance on diversity in her novel is just... It would make more sense if people of color, especially darker tone people of color, just had a dull or ashen undertone to their skin without altering the depth of their pigment. The pallor section of Stephanie's illustrated guide has been met with a lot of backlash, obviously. While some people argue that losing pigment doesn't make one any less black, others tend to be alarmed by the rule, accusing Stephanie Meyer of expelling people of color entirely from the saga. But there are also a few readers that accuse Stephanie Meyer of upholding racist religious beliefs within her vampire politics, allegedly. Let it be known that I am not particularly religious, I know nothing about religion, and I am not a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints, therefore I cannot speak for them or their beliefs. Never let a video essays be your only source, allegedly, 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 none of this is proven, please don't sue me. Stephanie Meyer is a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints. She was raised with this religion and she has noted that it influences what she writes. You might be able to find these influences in her characters, particularly in the wait till marriage plot between between Bella and Edward. But when the pallor section of the illustrated guide began making its round on TikTok, people found yet another example. Amazing Jada, in response to a video detailing the pallor section of the illustrated guide, explains their history of growing up Mormon while being black, end quote. And they state that the LDS church allegedly used to believe that black people are black due to the sins of Cain or the mark of Ham. In order to convert black people to Mormonism, um, they basically said, hey, um, we know you're black and we know that's a bad thing, um, but listen, hear us out. Um, if you convert to Mormonism and you live the Mormon principles and the way God wants you to live, uh, then when you die, God will grant you the ultimate blessing and will turn you into a white person. So when Stephanie Myers talks about vampires, eternal beings, um, when they go through their transformation process to their eternal form, uh, going from black to becoming white people, uh, yeah, that is definitely some Mormon influence there. Out of my own curiosity, I went and researched the history of the Mark of Cain and how this impacted black people who wanted to join the Church of Latter-day Saints. The historical accounts of this in particular are conflicting and vague. Some sources claim that never happened. Some say it happened, but not really to that extent. And the church more or less said, yeah, this used to be a belief, but it's not anymore. Sorry. So. Who's to say? I do want to emphasize that the church has denounced any and all racism as they state it does not follow their religious text. So my name is Bennett and I'm not in it. I'll leave some sources down below for you to peruse at your own discretion and let you come to your own conclusions. In terms of indigenous representation in the saga and possible alleged religious influences there, there is a history of anti-indigenous sentiments that were allegedly held by the church throughout the 1800s and even through the mid to late 1900s. The church conducted an Indian placement program between the 1950s and 1990s where indigenous children were placed with white families in the church in order to assimilate them into white American culture. To clarify why I included this specific tidbit of information, the church allegedly believed that indigenous people were evil or 
sinful due to their dark skin or their indigenousness and they believe that indigenous destiny included lightning in order to fulfill their role to god and the earth and they could do that using the placement program the main thing to take away from this information is the alleged link of indigenous identity to evilness sin violence etc compared to the righteousness of whiteness you can read firsthand accounts and other details down below as well similar to the church's bleak history with race twilight and midnight sun struggle hard the series features fictional characters from the very real indigenous tribe of the olympic peninsula the quileutes according to quileutenation.org the quileute tribe has quote lived and hunted in this area for thousands of years. Although the village of La Push is only about one square mile, the tribe's original territory stretched along the shores of the Pacific from the glaciers of Mount Olympus to the rivers of the rainforests." End quote. Meyer used facets of the Quileute tribe's history and legends in order to bolster her own narrative within the Twilight universe, stating, I did quite a bit of research on the Quileutes. All of the legends in the books are part of their tradition. The only legend that is not a part of the Quileute tradition is the part I devised specifically to fit the Collins, end quote. Despite her fascination with indigenous culture and her insistence on placing them in the story as a plot device, all her words, not mine, Stephanie falls into what C. Richard King calls a common belief held by people in the United States. This belief is, quote, unspoken and unconscious and implies that everyone has a right to use Native Americans as they see fit. Everyone owns them. Indianness is a national heritage. It is a fount for commercial enterprise. It is a costume one can put on for a party, a youth activity, or a sporting event. This sense of entitlement, this expression of white privilege, has a long history, manifesting itself in national narratives, popular entertainment, marketing schemes, sporting worlds, and self-improvement regimes. End quote. Meyer's decision to co-opt indigenous culture for her own has had repercussions for the real Quileute tribe. Anne Penn Charles, a Quileute tribe member, described in a 2012 interview her surprise at the sudden influx of younger tourists coming to the reservation. Quote, We're used to having tourists, but we started getting younger tourists. The elders, they said, Hey, Miss Anne, you gotta get out there and educate people that we're really not werewolves. End quote. Though Meyer does pull from existing Quileute lore, Anne Penn Charles emphasizes that the Quileutes prefer their humanity to be placed first and foremost. An indigenous subscriber responding to my Twilight newsletter also states, quote, Personally, I don't mind if tribes are used in media, as long as they are done right. I haven't watched any Twilight movies myself, but reading some articles has given me some insight. I really think Meyer should have made up a tribe rather than using an existing one. She sensationalized the Quileute's beliefs and teachings. I'm in Navajo myself. We are just kind of chilling in our reservation and are pretty closed off. I know for a fact that our elders would be pissed if a bunch of tourists flooded in because of a movie. LOL. End quote. Another subscriber states, Jacob's portrayal from Eclipse onward was backed by and actively played into dangerous stereotypes of Native American men being feral and predatory to white women and children. This is also exhibited in Sam Yuley's origin story, and the three times we see Paul Lahote, and it's so ugly." End quote. The Quileute tribe in the book, specifically those that are part of the wolf pack, are written to be impulsively violent. Since the Quileutes primarily serve as a foil to the Cullens, it makes sense to read the two groups against one another. The Cullens are often referred to as refined, controlled, and well-mannered, unlike the aggressive, uncontrollable, violent indigenous tribe. The Twilight Quileutes are so uncontrollable, in fact, that, quote, young werewolves are often unable to control their phasing, shifting forms whenever they feel anger. This unpredictability, combined with the massive size of the wolf form and the suddenness of the phasing process, makes werewolves dangerous to any humans in proximity to them during the change." End quote. The guide does state afterwards that they eventually master phasing with experience, just like vegetarian vampires. But I found that the wolf pack are rarely given as much grace as their white counterparts. Even at Edward's worst, he's still considered a good person by the narrative, by Stephanie, and by most of the characters. The Twilight Quill Ute wolf pack, on the other hand, are consistently depicted as violent, manipulative, and abusive. Arlene Hirschfelder in Paulette F. Mullen states, quote, the ongoing perception of Native Americans as dangerous contributes to negative expectations, interactions, and consequences. Thus, Native Americans are incarcerated at high rates, encounter discrimination and hate crimes, and experience other negative impacts. Stereotyped Native
Native American violence also leads non-Natives to fear Native people." End quote. It's also alleged that neither Meyer nor Lionsgate, who owns the franchise and all of its likenesses, have compensated the real tribe for their likeness being used. Despite being used as a plot device in one of the most popular series of the century, the Quileute tribe is currently being forced to crowdfund in order to meet dire goals for their community. They state, Quote, the Quileute tribal school is the only one in the world that teaches our own unique language and culture. Perched just beside the ocean, its breathtaking views are enough to inspire our Quileute children to discover more about our ancestral village and rich heritage. If we lose it to a horrific tsunami on a school day, we lose everything. Our children's lives, our culture's future. Relocating the tribal school to higher ground is truly a matter of life or death for the Quileute people. End quote. If you're able to contribute, you can find the link in my description box or you can go to mthg.org. This would be especially helpful to do if you recently purchased anything Twilight related. You can match the price in a donation to the tribe or just donate what you can. With all that in mind, it's hard to engage with the series the way Stephanie Meyer intends. Of course, stories and fictional worlds stand on their own, usually void of expectations from the author. I'm sure Stephanie Meyer would be a little remiss to find out that people want Edward dead and for Alice Cullen to take its place, but I'm also sure she isn't policing how people consume her art. However, the one thing we're supposed to follow in the story, the connection between Bella and Edward, is void. No one's reading Twilight for romance. At least, I'm not reading Twilight for romance. Audiences have found their own sanctuaries either in the aesthetic or side characters or humor of it all. A subscriber named Coley states, quote, I never really consumed Twilight in the way I think Stephanie Meyer was hoping people who read the books slash watch the movies would, as an epic love story kind of thing. Most of Bella and Edward's interactions actually come off as really funny to me, and I can quote way too many serious scenes because of how funny I found them." End quote. Another subscriber states, "'They're great movies, but in rewatching them all recently, I definitely find them great in a different way. I don't think the way I enjoy them was the intended way for it to be. I think a lot of my love of it comes from an opposition to the people who made fun of the people who liked these movies or wrote them off completely and ignore their qualities just because teen girls were its primary fan base. I enjoy it for being entertaining, not just because I enjoy the cringe, but to subconsciously get sucked into the drama of it all." End quote. I certainly see where people are coming from. When I say I'm a fan of Twilight, I mean it in the most abstract way possible. I like the idea of gothic happenings in the Pacific Northwest. I like the idea of Robert Pattinson in a peacoat. I like the idea of a blue tint on everything except for every movie after the first for some reason. Despite this, I do think that a love story exists in Midnight Sun, one that we could possibly even root for as Stephanie intended. She's not paying me to say this, by the way. I can't be brought for less than 25 million, that is. One of the most powerful love stories found in Midnight Sun, and quite possibly in the entire saga, is the story of platonic and familial love. We're able to see more interactions between Edward and his family, and his family and Bella, in ways we had never seen in the original series. According to the official illustrated guide, covens usually consist of two members, usually mates. Due to the competitive nature of feeding, larger covens are considered unsustainable. Despite this, the Cullens are considered one of the largest covens in the series and are still able to live together without fatal conflict. Their unusual bond causes Edward to question the word coven. He feels that it's too cold for their connection. Thus, they're often referred to as a family. We see how Edward's loyalty to his family drives his initial relationship with Bella. In fact, he doesn't kill her that first day, not because he's entirely moral or because he's somehow aware that he'll fall in love with her. The only reason Edward doesn't lure Bella out into the woods on her first day and fry her up like a kebab is because he wants to protect his family. He wants to be good for his father, Carlisle. Furthermore, when Edward is terrified that the monster within him will kill Bella, even after he realizes his feelings for her, he contemplates death. He knows with all of his vampiric strength and immortality, that he'll never be able to do it himself. He thinks of his family, the only people capable of ending his life, and knows that they'll never do it, even if he begged. Quote, even Rosalie, he states, who I'm sure would claim to be angry enough to do it, who might bluster and threaten the next time I saw her, would not. Because even though she sometimes hated me, 
She always loved me. I would not be able to harm any of my family, no matter how much pain they were in, no matter how much they wanted out. End quote. He thinks back on memories he has with his family, like when Carlisle surprised him with a Christmas tree in December of 1919, just a year after Edward's transformation. Or the time Edward found his way back to Carlisle and Esme after going rogue, neither one of them questioning or scolding him for his bright red eyes, key indications that he had drunk human blood. When he had met Alice for the first time and she had run up and hugged him, calling him her brother, her thoughts filled with emotions that Edward could only describe as, quote, so sure, so full of love for me, end quote. The novel describes how the clan's loyalty to Edward even reaches Bella, as they vow to protect her no matter the threat it brings them. Jasper projects his power over her, Esme, and Alice during the baseball scene in order to keep them out of the tracker's view. Emmett and Alice protect her when the tracker sees through Jasper's cast, and Carlisle even recruits Rosalie to protect Bella despite her animosity. Carlisle turns to Rosalie with a stern expression. Rosalie, will you do your part for our family? For Bella? She sneered the name. Yes, Carlisle responded. For our family, as I said, end quote. Edward describes how Emmett, his brother-in-law for all intents and purposes, is the best brother, and no one on earth has a brother like him. He even recounts a tender memory he has of Rosalie, who he never quite got along with until Emmett came in the picture. As Carlisle transformed Emmett on his deathbed, Rosalie and Edward waited by the lake outside their house. Quote, I wasn't looking for yet another addition to my family. I had never been particularly concerned about what Rosalie wanted or needed. But suddenly, seeing this all through her eyes, I could only root for her happiness. For the first time, we were on the same side. Those hours changed us both. When Carlisle finally came to call us home, we returned as brother and sister." End quote. I think I could read an entire novel just about the Cullen family. The love they share raises the bar for other relationships depicted in the novel. And it's probably the only aspect of the saga not touched by fatal flaws or confederate propaganda. Make sure to let me know what you thought about the novel in the comments below. If you want extra Midnight Sun ramblings, access to my notes for this video, and all of the future fun that will be presented on Patreon, you can subscribe using the link in my bio. And make sure to check out Babbel using the promotion link down below and start speaking your target language in a matter of weeks. Adios, te amo. Edward es un pequeño virgen caprón. And that roughly translates to Good job, Stephanie Meyer. Edward is a real gentleman.